In the last video, we've witnessed how Infinity Ward pushed the Call of Duty franchise into the modern age after Activision had finally and reluctantly greenlit their long-aspired shift into the contemporary setting with Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. The game ultimately surprised the publisher community and even the developers themselves with its overwhelming critical and commercial success. When Treyarch's World at War one year later barely failed to surpass it, Activision finally decided to move on and World War II was truly history. So without further ado, I'm Drifter. And I'm Ragnar, and this is the history of Call of Duty. Now, according to the biannual Call of Duty development cycle, 2009 was, once again, Infinity Ward's turn to deliver the next entry in the series. On December 3rd, 2008, only a few weeks after Treyarch had released World at War, Activision, now known as Activision Blizzard since the company's merging with Vivendi Games in July 2008, announced a direct sequel to Modern Warfare that was scheduled for November 2009. So, Call of Duty 6, Modern Warfare 2? Well, that's what it was originally announced as, but Infinity Ward kept referring to it plainly as Modern Warfare 2, attempting to remove the Call of Duty name completely from the series, because this time they wanted to make sure that the Modern Warfare franchise would be their very own intellectual property. Ultimately, they had to settle with including Call of Duty in the title because it provided a better brand recognition in the market. The single-player campaign continued the exploits of the small group of elite SAS soldiers revolving around Captain Price and Soap McTavish, this time giving him a face and a voice and sending players into several task force missions around the globe alongside him through the eyes of a new protagonist. The writers had initially intended to increase the grade of realism by basing the game's storyline on real-life conflicts, but due to the severity of the South Ossetia War and the Mumbai terrorist attacks in 2008, they eventually decided to craft a more fictitious narrative arc out of respect for the victims. The campaign depicted a conflict between the treacherous U.S. Army General Shepard and a group of Russian ultranationalist terrorists who schemed the United States and Russia into an all-out war on U.S. territory, with the Special Forces units surrounding Soap and Price being cast out and branded as traitors, forcing them to work from the underground to save the world. In contrast to the overall believable scenario for Modern Warfare 1, many people criticized the sequel's story to be highly illogical and confusing, while at the same time, people started wondering why Infinity War shifted Call of duty more and more towards action hero porn in the boldest of Hollywood style, the exact trope that they had so desperately wanted to leave behind when the founders left Electronic Arts and the Medal of Honor franchise. Once again, the campaign would send the player to locations all over the globe in an attempt to even further increase the diversity in gameplay styles from mission to mission, which made Modern Warfare 1 so refreshing. One moment the player is climbing icy mountains in Kazakhstan, sneaking covertly into a military base during a blizzard, and the next instant they're engaging in all-out firefights in a high-octane snowmobile chase sequence, all within a time frame of just 15 minutes. The mission settings included, for example, a hectic chase through the contorted favelas of Rio de Janeiro, a Russian invasion of American suburbs, a sequence which, by the way, heavily referenced the 1984 movie Red Dawn, a covert infiltration of an offshore oil rig via submarine, an airborne invasion of an abandoned gulag prison in Russia, and even a battle in the White House during the fallout of an orbital EMP strike, with literal helicopters raining from the sky. The game's soundtrack was produced and supervised by Hans Zimmer, with himself directly composing the main title, while his associate Lauren Balf orchestrated the rest of the score. Infinity Ward employed the next installment of their proprietary IW engine, which made use of a number of improvements Treyarch added during the development of World at War and the James Bond title A Quantum of Solace in 2008. One major improvement that Infinity Ward brought to version 4.0 of their engine was a complete overhaul of the enemy's AI, abandoning the old system of perpetually respawning enemies moving along fixed waypoints until the player triggered an invisible checkpoint on the map. Instead, they implemented a new, more dynamic artificial intelligence system that would make opponents actively seek out and drive the player through the level. But aside from the campaign, Modern Warfare 1 and World of War had already demonstrated that multiplayer was growing more and more important for the game's shelf life. Long-term metrics had shown that even though more people in total played the campaign, the user's overall time spent in multiplayer matches exponentially outranked the single-player experience. 
Modern Warfare 2's traditional multiplayer mode brought more extensive options for player customization, progression towards and weapon modification, and more gadgets and new kill streaks, such as the Predator Drone Missile Strike after 5 kills, or a massive AC-130 gunship after 11 kills, and even a tactical nuke after 25 successive kills, which would instantly end the entire round. For the PC version, Infinity Ward received a fair amount of criticism for dropping dedicated server support for the first time and instead making the Steam-supported IWNet matchmaking system mandatory for online play. This denied the PC community their tried-and-true amenities such as mod support, server bookmarks, and the plain and simple playing on the map of your choice. In addition to the multiplayer, Modern Warfare 2 was also fitted with a co-op mode called Spec Ops in which two players could attempt to beat modified single-player campaign scenarios with their combined efforts. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 was released worldwide on November 10, 2009 for PlayStation 3, Xbox 360 and PC, and it received universal critical acclaim, aggregating a 94% average score on Metacritic, and it also turned out to be a record-breaking video game launch. Within the first 24 hours, it sold over 4.7 million copies in North America and the UK alone, and it also became the fastest video game to generate a revenue of $1 billion at that point in history. It quickly grew into the highest ranking multiplayer game of that time too, with over 25 million unique players participating in online matches over PSN, Xbox Live and Steam. In the following months, two map packs were released that also sold over a million units each in the first week, and in addition to that, Activision produced several extended universe gimmicks, like the six-issue DC comic series Modern Warfare 2 Ghost, that covered the origin story of the in-game character Ghost. Not to confuse with Call of Duty Ghosts, which would come out a few years later. Around the same time, in April 2010, Treyarch started marketing their upcoming game in a slightly unorthodox fashion. They mailed unmarked USB drives to various gaming news publications and high-profile Call of Duty fans. These storage devices contained sound and text files that were meant to be decrypted in combined efforts, only to find a mysterious teaser for a yet unknown video game. They left people wondering until April 30th when they finally unveiled the origin of this little alternate reality game by announcing Call of Duty Black Ops, which would shift the series setting to the Cold War era. What many people probably didn't know is that technically Treyarch didn't create an entirely new universe for Black Ops, but it is actually a story built on the events and characters depicted in Call of Duty World at War, like the former Red Army soldier Viktor Reznov, who plays a crucial part in the story of both games. Black Ops' narrative takes place during the Cold War in the 1960s and is based on several real events and locations of that time period, like the 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba, the Soviet space program and its propaganda against the US during Kennedy's tenure, and the Vietnam War. It revolves around an elite group of covert operatives of the CIA, who carry out highly illegal missions with plausible deniability of the US government, so-called Black Operations. The plot itself covers several themes that play into typical Cold War fears, like an imminent nuclear war between Russia and the US, illegal mind control experiments and a threat of Soviet sleeper agents scattered all over North America, waiting for their signal to simultaneously overthrow the USA with nerf gas attacks. In comparison to their former titles, Black Ops presented a way more contrived and convoluted story arc, but in a way it was also a thematic compromise towards their publisher. Instead of going for a similar modern-day setting as Modern Warfare, they successfully pitched this concept that would meet their publishers' expectations halfway, chronologically exactly between World War II and today. But right from the beginning, Treyarch had the long-term goal to take the Black Ops series even further into the future. For the development, Treyarch was forced to rely on an older version of Call of Duty's IW engine than Infinity Ward had used for Modern Warfare 2, because their 4.0 version had been made available too late for Treyarch to switch its engines at that late of a stage in development. Nevertheless, Treyarch went to great lengths to deliver as accurate of a portrait of the Cold War as possible. It was the first time the entire studio worked exclusively on one project without any side contracts. They employed the same state-of-the-art motion capture technology as James Cameron used for Avatar in order to create the most lifelike animations in a Call of Duty game so far. Their studio also hired many military advisors such as Major John Plaster to help create an accurate depiction of the Vietnam and Laos scenario and former Soviet Special Forces operative Sony Pazikas to portray Spetsnaz soldiers during the Cold War as authentically as possible. The audio department once again put a lot of effort into lending the game a truly cinematic feel, for instance by relying on renowned 
renowned actors such as Sam Worthington, Ed Harris, and Gary Oldman, who reprised his role as Victor Reznov. Rapper and actor Ice Cube also appeared in the game as Joseph Bowen in the single player and as the announcer in multiplayer. To nail the musical atmosphere of the depicted time periods, Black Ops also featured iconic Vietnam War era tracks such as Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones and Creedence Clearwater Revival's Fortunate Son. Just like MW2 and World at War before, Call of Duty Black Ops came with three different game modes. In this case, the Story Campaign, the Multiplayer Mode, and Treyarch's Signature Zombie Co-op Mode. The traditional multiplayer retained the progression system first established in Modern Warfare, while further enhancing personalization and weapon customization options. It was also the first Call of Duty game which featured an emblem editor, which allowed custom logos and clan tags on weapons and even custom designs for weapon optics. Treyarch also decided to do something radically new to the Call of Duty series and add a theater mode to multiplayer. Treyarch saw the long-run success of Bungie's theater mode and the growing influence of social media content creation. The theater mode was designed to allow players to share their best clips with friends in-game and to allow content creators to more easily make montages. It functioned similarly to Halo 3's theater mode by saving snapshots of whole games, compiling them into a file, and enabling them for end-engine playback. Dolly camera, slow motion, and object tracking were also added in as well for those seeking a more cinematic approach to highlight clips. In addition, there was a new in-game currency called COD Points that would give players access to more unlockables. This currency could be earned through in-game progression and could also be gambled over in wager matches. Due to its popularity with the fanbase, the zombie mode was also further expanded. This time, it was even provided with a pretty complex backstory, at least for an optional four-player co-op mode. Zombies maps became an increasingly popular part of the DLC offering as well during this time. The Horde mode featured several maps spanning over different time periods from the final days of World War II to several Cold War scenarios, and it gave players access to various well-known characters such as Fidel Castro, John F. Kennedy, Richard Nixon, and Robert McNamara. It even featured an unlockable easter egg top-down shooter version of zombies known as Dead Ops Arcade. Call of Duty Black Ops was released worldwide on November 9, 2010 for PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, Nintendo Wii and PC, and although it couldn't quite catch up with the overwhelming critical acclaim of MW2, receiving only generally positive reviews on average, it managed to break sales records everywhere. Within 24 hours of its release, it sold over 5.6 million units in the US and UK alone and established a new record for largest entertainment launch in history. It even managed to garner more revenue than the highly anticipated movie Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1, earning more than twice as much as the film on launch day. Within just five days of its release, it had already reached a revenue of $650 million worldwide, surpassing the previous record of Modern Warfare 2 by over $100 million. With all of this success, it would be reasonable to assume that all parties involved were happy and satisfied. Activision amassing more money with each yearly release and Treyarch and Infinity Ward harnessing accolades and breaking sales records in tag team effort. But as we've mentioned before, Infinity Ward had once again strived for more independence by trying to claim the Modern Warfare branch of the Call of Duty franchise as their own intellectual property. Because of this, founding members and executives Jason West and Vince Zampella had engaged in conversations with other publishers such as Electronic Arts in 2010, which resulted in their immediate dismissal by Activision CEO Bobby Kotick due to breaches of contract and insubordination in March 2010. Following these events, almost half of the Infinity Ward staff collectively resigned and left the company, along with the lead designers, programmers, and artists. West and Zampella then went on to file a lawsuit against Activision claiming that the publisher had withheld substantial royalty payments and aiming to secure their contractual rights to the Modern Warfare intellectual property. On April 9th, Activision filed a countersuit stating that their actions firing Zampella and West were justified, which, after postponings of the trial, resulted in a confidential settlement between the two parties. On April 27th, 38, at the time, current and former employees of Infinity Ward went also forward with a lawsuit against Activision, calling themselves the Infinity Ward Employee Group and seeking a payment of over $600 million in compensatory and punitive damage from Activision for unpaid bonuses that their employer had promised them during the work on Modern Warfare 2. On July 9th, the legal disagreement ended also in a settlement, with Activision issuing a payment of $42 million in total to the plaintiffs. 
As if that wasn't enough, West, Zampella and a large number of the old team ended up under the wing of Electronic Arts, forming a new studio called Respawn Entertainment, which would go on to work on their new IP Titanfall. But this transition angered Activision's leadership and was immediately met with another lawsuit. This time against Electronic Arts, West and Zampella, accusing them of conspiracy, intentional interference with contracts, unfair competition and intellectual property theft. It almost took two years until May 17, 2012, until the lawsuit was once again privately settled, ultimately withholding the outcome of the legal battle to the public. During this entire debacle, the information had been leaked that, surprise, Infinity Ward had already been working on the third installment of the Modern Warfare series. But with such a massive hole in the company's infrastructure, Activision had to jump through some hoops if they wanted to meet their yearly COD cycle in time. Join us next time to see how Activision handled this crisis and in the meantime how Treyarch would lead their own Black Ops branch of the franchise into the future. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this part of the history of Call of Duty. If you enjoyed, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. And you can also subscribe to Ragnar, who is my co-host and editor for this video. Check out some of the links available there via annotations on the screen, or at least leave a nice comment. Drifter out.